And Welcome back. We are, I uh, hope everyone had a wonderful holiday. Nice uh, Thanksgiving, some good food. What about you, Jacqueline? I know you were away. I was, I was away. I was uh, in Arizona for the holiday weekend, visiting my family out there. And wow. uh, I, I did enjoy it. It was, it was nice to, to be with family. A little nerve wracking yeah. traveling though. So I'm self quarantining now and yeah. I feel fine. I am fine, but good, just for good. safety. But yeah, it was, it was great to be with family. I am. Um, so you did a plane? You took the plane then? I did. Yeah. How was your Thanksgiving? It was good. It was good. Uh, I I had mac and cheese. I was very, I was really <laughs> set on a baked mac and cheese for, for Thanksgiving. And then I didn't do turkey this year. I did this gourmet chicken pot pie, which was absolutely fabulous. Ooh. It was a Thanksgiving of one. So I didn't need a big turkey or anything, but this pot pie was amazing with um, just, there was, you know how it usually has a lot of sauce, but this was like chicken chunks and fresh vegetables. It was great. I got it at a farmer's market. So, that sounds um, so good. And welcome so, yeah. to everyone who's at. Oh, here we go. We're going to be getting started. I think Joe's getting us on, on board. Yeah. Welcome to Monday. Talk to you later, guys. Are you ready? Are you ready? Yeah. Welcome, folks. Thanks for attending. My name is Joe Muccioli. I'm the Artistic Director for the Jazz Arts Project, a nonprofit organization which, for almost 15 years, has been presenting and honoring jazz with world-class concerts and high-level education programs. I'm going to introduce our guests in just a minute, but first things first. Thank you to all our donors and supporters and sponsors. Our platinum presenting partner is Ocean First Bank. With support from Mammoth Arts and from you, our supporting members. So a heartfelt thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, there's a great lineage of trumpet players through the years, evolving styles one after another. I mean, how far do we want to go back? Well, there, there is, of course, the angel Gabriel, right? Gabriel blowing some mean choruses up in heaven. Of course, he, you know the story there. He had a friend named Saul. The, of course, he was a harpist. And uh, they, were just, they were trying to figure out where they can go play jazz. And turns out that down there below in the in the other place, there was this great discotheque, this great nightclub, and uh, it was owned by a friend of Saul's from from the before time, named Stan Stanley. It was Stanley Fran. They got special compensation to head down there once a week so they can. They can play their music, but the the thing is, they had to be back by midnight. So Gabriel and Saul, once a week, went down there. They took their instruments. Gabe, of course, on trumpet, and Saul with the harp. Kind of weird for jazz, but you know he figured it out. But anyway, they they played up a storm. They were loving it. The, the nightclub was fantastic. Um, Stanley invited them time after time and loved their camaraderie and all that. So one day, you know, it was getting close to midnight, and so they ran out of the club because they didn't, they, they, they couldn't, the, the gates would be closed to them if they didn't get there by midnight. 
So they ran out and they finally made it just, just in the nick of time and the gates closed behind them. And Sal suddenly said, oh no, I left my harp in Stan Fran's disco. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. I, w I wasn't about to sing it. Oh, All right, yeah, then we get to Joshua, I guess. Joshua blowing down the walls of Jericho, right? Must have been some mean trumpet playing there. Around the turn of the century, a turn of the last century, I should say, there was a tradition, a European tradition, of now cornet players, cornet soloists. And one of my favorites from that era is Bohemia Krill. Of course, when we get to the very beginnings of jazz, we start thinking of Buddy Bolden, even before the turn of the century, leading into Joe King Oliver, and of course, the great Louis Armstrong, who had a profound influence on trumpet players, singers, and music in general, continuing to this day. From there, we get to Roy Aldridge, Dizzy Gillespie, Lee Morgan, Miles Davis, Chet Baker, Art Farmer, Donald Byrd, Freddie Hubbard. From here, the lineage blossoms to legions of great players who all had the good fortune to learn from the greats before them. Great players today are essentially building upon the foundations laid by these innovators. Randy Brecker, Arturo Sandoval, Wynton Marsalis, John Faddis, Tom Harrell, and I put tonight's guest in among that category. Marvin Stamm's career has shown a richness and diversity most musicians would envy. There's something very special among musicians and their camaraderie that ensues. It's something quite intimate, inherent in the music perhaps, that performing together even once is often a bond that can last a lifetime. It is thought that the true measure of a man's wealth is his relationships, his friendships, and loved ones accumulated throughout the years. As you will see, someone like Marvin Stamp, who has performed and are recorded with hundreds and hundreds of fellow artists, is truly blessed with a wealth of fellowships and experience. Discovered by Stan Kenton at North Texas State University, he went on to become a member of the Kenton Melophonium Orchestra, and then with Woody Herman Band, and then with Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra, and then with Benny Goodman. And if that were not enough, he established himself as one of New York's finest studio musicians. Whether you know it or not, you are likely to have heard Marvin's trumpet many, many times in motion picture soundtracks, on TV specials, commercial jingles, not to mention the thousands of recordings he made as a sideman or guest. Instead of reading out a long-winded list of artists who Marvin has played with, Let's just listen to him play for a while while I roll a partial list from his discography. Thank you. 
Marvin Stam now focuses on his true passion, jazz, and on bringing jazz to wider audiences. Whether as a soloist or duo, his trio, his quartet, quintet, or in his symphony orchestra shows, Marvin communicates unparalleled artistry and a love for the music to audiences all over the world. Acknowledging his debt to the influence of former teachers and musicians, Marvin has spent a good deal of time and energy helping young musician students develop their own voices. His involvement in jazz education is taking him to universities and high schools across the U.S. and abroad as a performer, clinician, and mentor, perpetuating the traditions that jazz represents. In fact, I had the good fortune of conducting the London Philharmonic Youth Orchestra with Marvin as the guest soloist. We spent a week with the students and we put together a performance of the Miles Davis Porgy and Bess Suite. That was a fantastic experience, and I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marvin Sam. Good evening. Hey, hey, hey Marvin. Yeah. How are you? I'm doing very good. Oh, wait good. a minute, wait a minute. I'll give you some of that. <laughs> thunderous, thunderous applause. <laughs> It's always fun to be around people who love the music. That's that's the best. Holy cow! I can't tell you uh, how thrilled I am to uh, to have you on this because I don't know if I ever told you this before, but you know, in high school, I, at that time, I we I used to get together with my buddies and listen to those Project Three albums, the Enoch Light, and you know. We used to see the personnel on the on the uh, on the records, and there you were on just about every one of them. And you know, we used to talk about the, those musicians as if, like, people talk about sports figures. You know. Well, I'll tell you, growing up, what was great for me was growing up. These were my idols because I, I was listening to the records that they were all making with guys like uh, you know Gil Evans and. Bob Brookmeyer and for uh, uh, Manny Album, uh, Al Cohn, all those great New York writers. And uh, to eventually come to New York and be able to be among them was quite an honor. And uh, to this day, I still feel myself trying to reach the levels of uh, musicianship that every one of those people like Bernie Glow and Ernie Royal and Snooky Young all those great players and the wonderful trombone players like Irby and, and Jimmy Cleveland and, and uh, Garnett Brown, who's a, a old friend of mine and all so many great players, you know, and it's, it's uh, been a great journey. It was funny watching you go scroll through all of those records. I mean, some of them I hadn't even remember. <laughs> I figured that. <laughs> but, uh, they, a lot of them uh, bring back great memories of uh, sitting. Sometimes people ask me, who was the greatest person you ever worked with? And they expect me to mention Sinatra or uh, Michelle Legrand or, you know, any of the great names that I tell them. The greatest people that I ever worked with were the people that I was sitting in the section with. And and just just my colleagues that would, you know, that, that I could actually be among these great, great <clears throat> players, you know. So yeah. I've, I've lived my dream and I, I've, I've, I've lived with my, lived and worked with my, my heroes, and it doesn't get any better than that. Well, I, honestly, I put you among those heroes because, you know, when I graduated high school, I was hell bent on being a trumpet player, and the, and the first thing I wanted to do was be a studio player like you. And of course, I came in at a time when it was pretty much drying up, and I, I played a little little the tail end of it, but um, you know, at one time, people may not realize, but you guys were working three record dates a day sometimes and or a jingle or a movie or something like that and that was that was the scene in new york for what 20 30 years oh probably you know starting back into the uh go back into the radio thing there were there were musicians i talked to some of the older guys i got to know manny klein the great oh yeah Klein, sure who grew up in new york and studied with schlossberg and uh, uh, Manny, at a certain point in time, was one of the busiest guys in, in New York City. And he told me that uh, uh, a lot of times they were so busy that they didn't make the rehearsals for the shows. They sent someone in to do the rehearsal. 
and mark their parts. Right. And he came in and sight read them, changes and all, pencil markings, cuts and all kinds of stuff with these different artists. And this they did this day after day after day. And it goes back to, you know, like the early 30s or I guess the early 30s. And uh, so music in New York in, in the studio fashion uh, goes back for many, many years. And uh, when I came to New York, I, I was here at the end of 1966 and I was very fortunate through my uh, being called to sub on Dad and Melt's band one week after I had arrived into town, which got Dad me, Jones, Dad Jones, Mel Lewis. Yeah, he does. which got me involved in the uh, jazz and studio scene almost immediately. And it uh, I left the studios in 1990 when I I just really wanted to get out and play again, you know, I mean, full time. And I guess it went on for another six or seven years. But, you know, the the uh, technology, the synthesizers and all, and also the way business was done after that was introduced into the business, uh, the way many people from record companies and jingle companies uh, began to rely on the technology and, and not so much upon the musicians and used it really as a way to get labor and, right uh, so it, it kind of like has died out now there's very little very little studio work in new york anymore and very little in chicago from the people that i know there that that tell me in la i guess there's still television some, some movies movie stuff but even a lot of that uh, has gone overseas yep you know i mean someone was telling me that they could hire a hundred piece orchestra to do a studio date and have them work two, three hour sessions for something like a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars a day. Yeah. In 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 the eastern eastern Europe. I I, I did one of those in Bulgaria actually yeah. a while back. A while yeah. back. And great um, players too. Great yeah, great players. Yeah. Especially the string players. Those that Eastern Bloc you know country with string players are amazing. Yeah. But people may not realize or had known back then that, you know, you could walk into a studio um, back in those days and you'll see a 50 to 100 piece orchestra playing a, a 30 second jingle, or I guess a 60 second yeah. jingle back then, right? Yeah, uh, a TV commercial <laughs> or locked in there for a couple of days playing, doing a film, doing a movie. Yeah. yeah. And this was, you know, uh, a lot of the camaraderie came from that no doubt because these were your your colleagues you were sitting next to and and uh working with well you spent hours each week with with uh you know it was it was a rather large community actually at the time that i i got to new york and there were segments of it i mean there was a there was a whole community of people who were recording italian music with italian artists like enzo stewardi and, and people right like that. And then there were, uh, you know, there were guys, I guess, from from other ethnic uh, uh, backgrounds playing uh, recording sessions all the time in, in that that uh, genre of music. Uh, whereas the guys that, that I started playing with, a lot of them came from uh, the road bands and they were jazz musicians, but still great all around instrumentalists. And they did they did all kinds of work, uh, everything from. Uh, uh, Broadway shows, recording Broadway uh, uh, albums, uh, to playing with Enoch Light on some of the things he did that were commercial music, right up to when he started uh, allowing jazz to seep into into uh, his uh, company, and, right. and then on to you know right up through Gil Evans and and all those guys, you know. So it was it was pretty amazing. Uh, uh, there was so much work going on at that time. And basically, uh, somebody asked me one time, says, well, did you guys hang out a lot on the weekends and this and that? I said, no, we worked together all week. So a lot of times we would start in the morning and several of the guys would be on the next session. So we might stop and have lunch somewhere real quick and then go to the next session. And then if you had a night session, some of those guys may be on that date too. So, you, you know, you would be hanging out all week with, with a, a whole group of people, you know, not all of them at all the same time. But, right. You know, just more from session to session. So on the weekend, you kind of wanted to get away from everything and have some time with your family or get away and do something, you know, 
Uh, but it was it was a great time and it was thrilling. I remember feeling excited every time I went to work. And and you know somebody somebody made a, a joke one time they were they were saying about uh, uh, seeing musicians run into each other in an airport or walking down a New York street and you hadn't seen each other in a few months and you just walk up to each other and hug each other and say wow do you remember that do you remember that time we played that gig with so and so he said how many times do you think an accountant would come meet another accountant in the airport go up and hug him and say hey, do you remember the you remember the honor of 04? <laughs> That's funny. That's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty. It, it was. It was. It was a great time. It really was. I'm more than just very fortunate to have been part of it. Yeah, I know there's, there's a lot of great music going going by there. Um, and one of the things about doing the studios, of course, is you had to be a crackerjack sight reader. I mean, you'd, you'd come into a date, you had no idea what was going to be on that page. And um, you, you were expected to run it down the first, the first chance, the first take. Yeah. yeah. Because, you know, time was money. If you screwed it up, they had to, you know, spend more time fixing it. Um, you didn't get hired back the next time. That's true. The, the, the players was of such a uh, high quality. It, it's... Uh... It's just amazing. I mean, when you think about uh, now everything's on YouTube, if you have, I, I do a lot of listening to symphony orchestras because, mm -hmm. uh, you know, that they're recorded all over the world and, and, and it's, it's fantastic to be able to listen to that music. Well, these were people of the same caliber as musicians from any symphony orchestra. They just played another kind of music. And a lot of them played in that kind of music too. I mean, for instance, Bernie Glow, the Bernie great Glow. player also played first trumpet on some of the Leonard Bernstein recordings, some things that he did, and played in the section, what was it, Gunther Schuller did a piece called, uh, oh gosh. Uh, it oh, it wasn't Gunther, it, it was Stravinsky, wasn't it? No, um, it was Bernstein. Um, yeah, he did yeah. riffs and so on. Riffs, so riffs and so ramps, and stomps, yeah. Right. But but uh, Gunther Schuller wrote Symphony for Brass, where he oh, used right. most of the people most of the players were from the uh, Met or the Philharmonic, but right. he had Bernie there to play on some of the movements that that uh, required the kind of the jazz right. too. So did you know? Was, did you know a guy named? Did, sorry, did you know a guy named Gino Bazzacco? Yes, <laughs> he was a buddy of mine. He lives in Jersey. Yeah, I used I used to work with him occasionally, and um, he told me that he was called into the Philharmonic to record the um uh uh the bernstein the big show um what the hell's the show side story I'm, oh you oh, right? you oh you're thinking of uh, west side story west side story yeah uh to be the lead player on that recording so the filler near philharmonic recording if you listen to west side story it's gino bazzacco playing lead i you know i didn't know that uh uh, that's that's good information. I didn't know that. I remember. I know that the, they had. They used to bring Bernie in a lot of times to play lead on when they did the. Uh, what do you call it? the cast album? Things. Right. But uh, I had understood that Gene actually was hired to play the show. He did play the show, but that's why they brought him into the Philharmonic to play uh, the okay. lead. I didn't know the Philharmonic did a recording of it, but that's interesting to know. They did. And, yeah. you know, I mean, I was a Vacchiano student, right? so that was not something that he was going to, he was about to, to do. No, not uh, that from, from his end. <laughs> but, but I can tell you a, a funny story. The reason why in that book, I don't know if it's still a case, they may have redone the books, but in the West Side Story book, the Broadway book of music, in the in the second trumpet part, I think there are parts written for trumpet in D. It's written for D trumpet because at that time, you know, Bernstein wanted to write these high notes for trumpet, and he brought it to Vacchiano to say, "What do I do with this? These are these are like high Fs and Gs," and Vacchiano said, "Write it for D trumpet. It won't be a problem." A D trumpet, for those of you, to, you know, it's a smaller horn. It's sort of pitched uh, a third higher. Yeah. yeah. And Vacchiano was, was known for using, he was the first trumpet player in the New York Philharmonic. He was known for using D trumpet on a lot of recordings. 
So and and to the when I played the show, I, it must have been twenty years after that. Um, there were the parts still trumpet and D. Yeah. So, that's, <laughs> so there's a lot of those little little quirks and stuff in the industry, certainly that you know guy, and that's one of those those things that bring musicians together worldwide. You know, there's stories like that that go around, and there's instances that uh, that are shared shared experiences that make it a very small world of, of musicians, to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. It was pretty exciting in those days. It, it's, it's interesting how things have changed. And of course, when the pandemic hit, that really changed things greatly. I mean, there's nobody anywhere playing. Right. right. I mean, you, when you just stop for a moment to think about that, nobody is playing. Now that that's that's astounding. Broadway is shut down. The Metropolitan Opera is shut down. New York Philharmonic is shut down. The jazz club. It's all over the country. I mean, some yeah. of the jazz clubs have groups coming in playing to no audience, but doing it streaming and song. But I mean, music right. as we know it, you know. Well, you know that's why we're here to to try and share what we can, you know, and and have some kind of an experience um, as a as a as as humans um uh, that love music that's why we're doing this thing yeah. you know and uh, i thought it was interesting that it, it took a pandemic for us to come up with these kinds of of events and i think i think we're going to continue doing them even you know if we when, when we open up and and start having live music again i mean there's no reason why we can't have these kinds of these hangs as it were yeah I think it's, a, you know, the thing is, is that for, for years, people always thought that, that uh, music was, you know, being performed out there. And even when you went to a theater to hear a concert, you never really got to uh, talk with the artists for the most part. I mean, it was a rarity if you did. So right. this, this, this type of, of gathering really brings, brings us all in, in much closer contact with each other and and you know you start to realize as as most jazz musicians do the reason they like to play in clubs is because they want to get that feeling from the audience you know when they play it's so important to feel that the audience is part of what you do and uh it's it's uh, it's inspiring to play in front of people you can have the same group the next night go to their home go to somebody's house and the four of them are playing in a room, but it's not the same because there's no one there listening. That's right. That's you know? exactly right. So they're, they're, this is, as some, some of the players that I've talked to have said, to me, they think this is basically, you know, one of the big features in the future. Yeah. Yeah. I think that there are things going to like this that are going to continue. Um, I just hope that it doesn't, diminish the value that people see in live music yes you know the thing is is that uh, music for most people i mean what i did what i was able to become a part of was not something that uh, is easy to achieve the, the reason being that uh, there were, you know, at least when I came up, there was New York, Chicago, L.A., Dallas, maybe, uh, I mean, for for playing orchestra or, or big band music or jazz, leaving out uh, Muscle Shoals where they just, you know, did recording projects and rock and roll. But the type of music that we played, there weren't a lot of places to play, but they were they were very busy. But for a lot of musicians to be able to achieve that, they had to have some entree into the business, which usually had to be going on the road with a band to get experience, maybe having a couple of years playing in a place like I did in Reno, playing shows, uh, so that when you go into a place like Los Angeles or Chicago or New York, you had experience behind you. But even then, you could go to New York and you could be working in certain areas of the music, but never see a recording studio unless you happen to just 
be at the right place at the right time. For instance, I mentioned it earlier. Uh, when I came to New York, I didn't know anyone. Now, I'd been on the road with Kenton and with Woody Herman, and I'd spent a couple of years at the show, and I had met a lot of musicians being on the road. I played with Buddy Morrow's band for a while one summer. And, uh, but I decided I was going to come to New York and just see what would happen. So I came in and I checked into a hotel in Midtown on 49th Street. At that time, it was called the Forest Hotel. It's one of the places where the bands, when, when we would come through, the bands would, would uh, stay there or over at the President Hotel. Basie's band always stayed at the President other bands stayed at the Paramount. So I rented a room there and I figured I would stay there for six months. And, you know, in those days, a hotel in New York, I think I paid something like 200 a month for a really nice size hotel room right in the middle of Manhattan. It was between 8th Avenue and Broadway on 49th Street. So I was two blocks from Jim and Andy's, which was mm -hmm. one of the bars that that all the studio musicians and jazz musicians hung out at. So I checked into my hotel, put my bag down, walked over to Jim and Andy's three blocks away. No one happened to be in there, which was unusual, I found out later. But at that day, there was no one in there except the bartender and this, this young African, uh, young, he was older than me, this African-American gentleman sitting down at the bar. So I sat down a seat or two away from him. Bartender comes over and asked me, you know, what I would like. I asked if I could get a cup of coffee. He said, sure. So he went and he got a cup of coffee. This, this gentleman turns to me and he says, uh, you new in town? I said, uh, yeah, I just arrived today. He says, uh, are you a musician? I said, <laughs> yes. I said, he says, what instrument do you play? I said, well, I'm a trumpet player. He said, oh, and he stood up and put his hand out. He says, my name is Ernie Royal. I'm a trumpet player. <laughs> that was the first person I met in New York. Wow. You know, from it, at that time. So we he happened to be uh, free until the evening. He had a record date. And he sat and talked to me for two, two and a half hours. And he, he, he really told me. He gave me all the guidance in the world about what to do to get with this this particular answering service. Uh, use him as a reference. Radio uh, registry. Yeah, radio registry and various things about the business. While I'm in town, where am I living? Oh, you're in the hotel. In those days, there were no pagers and there were no cell phones or anything. He said, always let the 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 uh, answer, telephone answering service know where you are. He says, if, if, if they know you're home and you're there, fine. If you go out for lunch, tell them you're going out for lunch and you'll call in in 30 minutes. Or if you're going over to Jake Coven's studio on 48th Street to practice, let them know. Jake Coven has a phone over there that's a direct line to them. They'll call over there if they need you for something. So it was, it was like one of those things where you were always on call for anybody who needed a sub or to cover me for a while or whatever. And uh, a week to the day after I was in town, I had uh, met someone and, and uh, they, they said, why don't you come over to dinner? So we were just about ready to sit down to have a bite to eat and the phone rings at this person's house. I had given it to the answering service and they said, Jimmy Nottingham wants you to sub in the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Jazz Orchestra at the Vanguard. Wow. He's, he's come down with the flu. So of course, I said to the person who had fixed dinner, excuse me, I got to go. <laughs> went back to my hotel, got my horn, went down to the Vanguard and played and subbed uh, for, I guess, for Jimmy. There was someone else there subbing for Snooky Young because Snooky was probably out with, uh, oh, Peggy Lee or someone like that. He, he would go out with them on tour sometimes. And... Uh, I heard at the end of the gig, somebody came up and said, Dad, and I'd like to talk to you in the dressing room. Dressing room was the kitchen of the Vanguard in those days. So I went back and, and they said, uh, we'd like for you to become the swing man in the trumpet section. And I, of course, I knew what that meant because that was a term used a lot in, in Las Vegas or, or rather Reno when I worked out there. What they meant was that any of the four trumpet players, Richard Williams, Bill Berry, 
Jimmy Nottingham or Snooky Young. If anybody had a gig, call me first to come and sub. So I ended up playing on all four chairs. But in the meantime, this was at the very end of the first year that Dad and Mel were in the Vanguard. They started at the Vanguard in February of 1966. But this was in probably the first week of December of 1966. So at that time, it was such a novelty that this rehearsal band was playing at the Vanguard on Monday with all these great jazz players, Eddie Daniels, Joe Farrell on tenor saxophones, uh, Pepper Adams on baritone, Jerome Richardson and Jerry Dodgen, the trombone section with Bob Brookmeyer and Tom McIntosh and Garnett Brown and Cliff Heather on bass trombone, the four trumpets, Richard Davis, uh, and, and Mel and Thad, of course, and, uh, oh, come on, Marvin, don't, don't, don't have your mind go out on you. <laughs> That's pretty impressive already. Well, um, anyway, all of those people. So in any night, Sonny Rollins could come down to hang out. Uh, all come, uh, Quincy Jones would come down. Oliver Nelson would come down. Yep. You know, Patrick Williams would come down with Jack Courtner. All kinds of people. Getz came in one night that I remember him being there. And it was one of those things where they knew everybody in town except this kid. Who the hell is that? <laughs> and along with that, the, the trumpet players in the band, particularly along with Mel, were very generous in going out and spreading my name around. So, I mean, now you, you say to this, well, are you talented? Yeah, I was talented and I had developed my skills to a pretty high degree to be able to go in and do that. But what would happen if I hadn't walked into that bar and met Ernie Royal? How do you plan that? It's right. pure luck. It's pure luck. And so, you know, most of the great things that happen happen by happenstance, you know, that it's, it's just pure luck and it's being at the right place at the right time, which is something you can never, ever plan. The only thing you can plan is to be prepared if the opportunity ever comes. And of but course, you, sorry. I was gonna say, you have to credit, or at least I have to credit all the people all my life who've gone to bat for me. And it started when I was 15 or 16 years old and it happened all through all through my career people who for one reason or another wanted wanted to help me get wherever i wanted to go well yeah. that wouldn't have happened of course if there wasn't something behind it if there wasn't some some serious talent and serious um something for you something said by you that that touched them to uh, allow them to want to do that and of well, course of course um uh the fact that you came in there with that talent these opportunities no doubt gave you that much more experience so it, it developed you even further yes for sure for sure the thing is is that you know that i guess what i what i want to say is uh nobody does it by themselves you know it's the thing that's that is important to realize is that one way or another, you have to be able to connect with people. And I guess I was very fortunate that I came, I born and raised in Memphis to an old fashioned family who taught me to respect all kinds of people and particularly people that were older than me. And, and then as I got into the music business, was taught to understand to always respect those who have been there and done that. The guy who walks in and wants to be a star is the guy who'll probably walk out never having a chance to come back again. <laughs> yeah. the, person who, the person who wants to learn and wants to be there and appreciates what people you know, uh, do for them, those kind of people really have a, a good, a good opportunity to be part of the gang. Well, talking about the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra, for those of you who don't aren't familiar with it, um, and if even if you are, go out and get some of those recordings. Um, look them up. There's there's some fantastic music on it. And John Gentile um, said, "Hopefully, everyone has heard all my yesterdays, a long lost recording of the Thad Jones Mel Lewis Orchestra opening at the Vanguard in 1966, which is fantastic." 
So there you go. Yeah. You know, I, we have a couple of clips we could play. Do you have a a a Druthers? I've got uh, Butter, Alone Together, and Invitation. What's your pleasure? Uh, you want to start out with something a little more down? Okay, we could do that. Play play uh, Invitation. Yeah. Such a great tune. Sure. I will uh, set this up. Uh, if I could find it, there it is. I think. Let's see if this works. Give me a thumbs up if you can hear this. Why is it not playing? Uh, Joe, you are muted. I don't know if you realize that. I did it again. There we go. <laughs> Thunderous applause for you, Marvin. That's, that was beautiful. Did you like the way uh, Bill Bill Mays was accompanying himself? It was almost like having a harp underneath his piano. Yeah, I saw that. Yeah. He, what a what a beautifully creative musician. We worked together for gosh, twenty five 
years or more. And uh, I spoke to Bill just the other day. He and his wife have a place in Pennsylvania up uh, just across the New York border. And uh, they also have a little place down in Florida that they go in the wintertime. And uh, he's spending more of his time now playing with uh, his trio. And we we worked together a long time. And then I'm now I'm working with a, a, a newer quartet with uh, pianist Michael Holliber, who is also another oh, yeah. one of extremely creative players and, and a marvelous young bassist by the name of Mike McGurk and also uh, uh, drummer uh, Dennis McCrell, who I've known. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And four, I mean, three marvelously creative musicians. It's just, just amazing. To, you know, if if you can if you can be surrounded by people that never, that always make you know that thrill of playing music. It's the best. It's just the best, you know. Uh, I, it's just he, just hearing that thing from two thousand six. And just listening to the delicacy that Bill uses on the piano and the clarity of every every run that he makes and so on is just just marvelous, you know. Yeah. Yeah. That, that I love. I don't listen to my own recordings, but when I do, I end up listening to the players that I play with more than I listen to me because I know every mistake I feel I made. <laughs> so, Marvin, I want to know. Um, you've been uh, living your passion, so to speak, and I'm curious. Do you feel as if you've ever had to work a, a day in your life, so to speak? I mean, do you, I mean, some people, you know, have to do things that they don't care to do and drudgery and so forth. But with what you're doing, I'm just curious, what has your relationship been? And if you had one moment, what was what, what would be a challenging musical moment for you in your career? Well, uh, there have been a lot of challenging moments. Uh, you know, I think uh, I maybe I can combine them in a way. Uh, even when I were, when I came to New York, I was working with all of these classic players who I had known of their names on, you know, for years because of the recordings that I used to listen to growing up through music. And when I came to play with them, it was, I, I can't tell you what gentlemen and ladies all of these people were. I mean, there was a, they, they showed such respect to each other, as well as the fact that, you know, many of them were very close friends. Uh, the, uh, the attitude among everyone was just fantastic. And along around, oh, after rock and roll started coming into the scene, and for a while, you know, they weren't, they weren't using many horn players, and then uh, the Tijuana Brass came along, and all of a sudden they were using trumpets and a saxophone and a trombone, you know, and that kind of stuff. And a lot of young players came in. A lot of the older players, either through attrition or health or whatever, kind of were morphing out. And by around 1983, 84, it was mostly some of the younger players coming in. The difference between the, the groups, the, the attitude of, of those, I guess you'd have to call them generations, even though there was only 20 years difference, the older groups that I came in with thought of everything as being a we community. Mm. A lot of the younger players came in and they seemed to think of things along of a me community and I had always been taught the old way and some of these players really got rid of I mean there were times you'd go to sessions the attitudes between even the producers and the musicians a lot of sarcasm and this and that I mean it was supposed to be fun but I started to find that it wasn't fun for me mm. and I mean sitting down playing with them they were all great players that was fun but you know, guys would show up late on dates because they had booked too closely and they were, you know, they didn't they didn't bother to send anyone to cover them. And they, you know, just things that were that in our business were considered considered. Mm -hmm. And after a while, it, it began to wear on me. And so I had an opportunity around 1987, thanks to another trumpet player, Lou Soloff, 
Oh, uh, wow. He was asked to go out on tour with the George Gruntz Concert Jazz Band, which was a group of American and European musicians that toured every year, usually spring and fall for two weeks or two and a half, three weeks at a time. Mm -hmm. Very good, very good group. And uh, he recommended me to go on the band playing in his place. And George and I uh, became very close friends. And I stayed with him for about 20 20 some odd years from 1987 to 2009. Mm -hmm. So anyway, uh, that kind of made me really think about what I wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And I decided that the thing that I wanted to do was really go back to playing jazz. So I, I kind of directed myself that way. And I decided that I would never turn down a jazz gig for a studio gig, even though the money was never the same. But I needed to, to go this, this direction to satisfy something, which meant mm -hmm. a, uh, eventually if I got out that while I might be able to make a living, it was for a while, it was a sacrifice on my family. Uh, and I always had their support. And, and I mean, they were great. Nancy and the kids were, you know, have always been fantastic. That but the, the thing is, is that uh, I was getting... I was getting to the point where I didn't want to deal with people who had that me mentality. And a lot of the music we were playing was, was overdubbing and a lot of it was just jingles and there wasn't so much jazz recording going on as there used to be. And then there was this other opportunity of the grass being greener on the other side of the economic fence. Uh, and of course, it was a lower economy on this other side, but the grass was a lot greener in my <laughs> but, but it was it, long grass too, right? You couldn't mow it. <laughs> but but it but it was a challenge, you know, from that standpoint. And it also meant that when I if if the more that I uh started, you know, playing as a jazz player full time out on the road, I was gonna be away from my family a lot. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, my girls were, I think. 13 and 10 at the time or something like 14 and 11. And Nancy has always been a very uh, independent, independently spirited person. Uh, I don't think she ever asked me to turn down a gig. And you know, we've been married 48 years. Mm, congrats. She never asked me to turn down a gig for something for her. Yeah. Aww. And uh, I, I wish that I could say that I had probably been as generous of spirit the only thing is that she did know that I was married to music as well as her. So there had to be a sharing there. But, yeah. uh, but I mean, th those, you know, there was that bit of drudgery, but, you know, compared to someone, you know, I think about this pandemic. I live in a little town called North Salem, New York, and we're 50 miles north of New York City right at the top of Westchester County. We moved up here 42 years ago when it wasn't even considered commutable distance into the city. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. I mean, the trains were uh, were not electrified. So, you know, bad weather, you didn't know whether you were going to get to work or not. So, <clears throat> but uh, I, I mean, this, we, we, the town that I live in, which is really not a town per se, there's no real, town center there's a lot of horse farms up here and there's a lot of open land and a lot of woods a lot of dirt roads places to walk i'm out jogging or walking every day as well with you know with my dog by myself whatever and i and and okay i can't play but i do have you know i have some savings and stuff from all the years that i've been working and this pandemic is taking toll on everyone, every one of us in one way or another. I mean, even if you have no economic worries, there it's still it's it's omnipresent in our yeah. minds. But I think about how fortunate I am to be up here where there's space. I don't have to be around a lot of people. It's a lot easier to, to distance, you know, from people and so on. And I think about all the people and I have I'm able to to call up Instacart and order food from a store instead of having to go in. And I think of all the people that are worried about their kids, giving their kids breakfast or lunch tomorrow, mm -hmm. you know, and I realize yeah. how, how lucky I am to live here. And I just would, I would just hope that everyone who 
has the good fortune to be able to put food on their table and to keep their house. Just give some thought to those people who at the end of December might be evicted from their home because that moratorium is over with. Yeah, yeah. And just think about those people because there are, you know, they live right here with us. Many well, times you, we don't see them, but they live here. You, you uh, started uh, by talking about uh, one of the things that you uh, didn't really care for was trans kind of uh, going from a we community to a me kind of centered uh, identity, so to speak. And I wanted to kind of catch on to the we uh, community and speak about Jazz Arts Project a little bit and give a thanks to Jacqueline and the team, uh, Joe and our board members, Ellie and Stephen, who are here with us, who make this possible, uh, who make it possible for us to connect during this pandemic. Uh, Jazz Arts Project is a nonprofit, and we do uh, use the funds uh, to support our education programs, which is Jazz Arts Academy. And we also do a free middle school program uh, in the summer, which we did this year online. And we also provide scholar education scholarships and for those who aren't able to afford to uh, work with Jazz Arts Academy. And so what we're seeing right now is uh, tomorrow is a special day called Giving Tuesday, which is December 1st. Giving Tuesday is a global uh, movement of generosity that is designed uh, to help um, support nonprofits and organizations that are doing great work like Jazz Arts Project. And so who you see here is one of our recent graduates. This is Frank Dabari, who uh, graduated from um, Jazz Arts Academy uh, this summer. Uh, he graduated in June and he is now studying music uh, at um, Brookdale uh, College. I think Brookdale College, and he uh, plans to continue uh, his well, career in music. And I'm going to uh, get close to the screen so I can actually read it. Actually, <laughs> let me put it. Actually, <laughs> let me pull it up over here on my other. On my, I got another place I can pull it up at because I can't actually read that from the screen here. Give me one second. I apologize for this, but I want to read his quote to you. Uh, here we go. His quote says, "Oh, come on, computer." Jazz Arts Academy is very important because they taught me to try my best not to give up on it and work as hard as I can. And uh, he shared that uh, jazz music is a very difficult uh, genre to learn, but he was persistent and dedicated and he continues to study, uh, study jazz. So tomorrow is a special day. You're gonna get this in an email tomorrow uh, uh, for Giving Tuesday. Uh, we ask that you please spread the word uh, we know that many of you have contributed already, so thank you for your contributions. And uh, for those who may not have contributed or are waiting to contribute, please uh, uh, think about us on Giving Tuesday and make a contribution uh, tomorrow. Uh, when you see this email, please spread it, uh, share it with your friends, family. Uh, the other thing that we should let you know is that due to the COVID Act, uh, which passed recently, um, uh, donations are deductible uh, to nonprofits uh, up to $350. So that is some new information that uh, passed due to COVID. So you can get a deduction uh, with your with your contribution. And so uh, we wanna thank you. The other thing that we should mention is that uh, we are working on a special event, a special fundraising event, which we plan to do before the end of the month. So stay tuned for that. Um, so Marvin, I wanna say, um, you know, I for some reason um, there's two things I want to know. One, I feel like there's a book in you. I don't know if you have any <laughs> any intention on doing anything with your memoir or notes or anything like that. But also, um, I get a film sensibility with you. I was thinking, wow, I was like, there'd be a great, probably be a great subject for a movie of some some sort. You, the way you tell your stories and the experiences you've had uh, were some wonderful. I visually, I could feel. Uh, the, the scene that you were setting and where you were and what you were doing. It was very, very beautiful. And I appreciated hearing those stories. Well, I, I think, you know, one of the things that I've always loved about this business is that having grown up, always working with people 10, 15, 20 years, 30 years older than me is, is being able to sit on breaks or riding on a bus or whatever, and listening to them tell the stories of their experiences because mm -hmm. they had been places and worked with players that I would never meet, never see, but had known of for years. And, and how interesting that was to me to hear 
the history of the music through so many different uh, people's experiences, and and it was it was terrific. You know, uh, yeah. I remember I remember being in the dressing room one night after I'd been in New York for a while. I was subbing for somebody. It might have even been Ernie Royal uh, at a show. Backing up, I can't even think of who who the singer was at the time. But uh, I was in the dressing room listening to Jerome Richardson and Frank West. Oh yeah, tell stories, and wow. both of them both of them were great storytellers. And, and talk about you know laughing. The, the, <laughs> that's that's the other thing about musicians, such a sense of humor. Yeah, you know, there's so much so much. Uh, Clark Terry was another one, listening to all the stories oh, yeah. that he would tell. And some of them, I mean, you know, absolutely tragic. I mean, you know, guys like Milt Hinton and Clark and all those guys from the early years in the Basie band and, and Jimmy Lunsford's band and uh, uh, Jay McShann, all those groups. And they were they were traveling through the South in the 30s. And, mm. you know, and in and, and the 40s and, and Clark would tell some stories that were just hair raising. But at the end, he made them so humorous that, you know, that, that he would laugh at him. And there's one of the guys that was probably maybe tell you a funny story about Clark that I heard. He was he, he was kind of uh, uh, co-sponsoring a program. in I don't know, there was a middle school or high school. And something came up one time about somebody saying something in, uh, that was that was that was a. Uh, it happened to be at a time when the, when uh, there was a lot of kind of civil rights stuff going on, and and it was at a a school, an African American school, and some of the kids were talking to Clark about you know Whitey and and all of that, you know which we know that is, you know, from the history of this country, uh, is certainly justifiable in many things. But Clark took issue with it and he shut the program down. Mm. He says, I'm not dealing with, I'm not, I'm, I don't deal with, with that stuff. Yeah. We're just people, black, white, purple, red. That's, that's who we are. Here, here. You know. Here, and, here. And, and, and I would say. I would agree with that. As I've gotten older, that's become a perspective that I embrace. I want to read a comment to you that we got from Jay uh, Gentile. Uh, he says, you are a master musician, an engaging storyteller, a jazz educator, and one of the nicest people in the music business I have ever met. And he wanted to thank you for sharing it with us tonight. So I wanted to read that to you. It was a beautiful, beautiful here, here. I second the motion. I, you know, I would, uh, I would do, I'd, like to, I'd like to do one thing, uh, just, a, just a quick thing. Uh, my, what I'd like you to take my honorarium and contribute it to the Jazz Academy. Wow! Oh, would you? Thank mind? you so much, Marvin. Oh, thank you so much. I, I, thank you very much. It's my honor. My honor. Thank you. I really appreciate that. I'm truly I honored. I appreciate what all of you are doing, and you know, I'm. I'm I don't want to get into anything anything political. I'm sure by now you Probably know my political leanings. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Just one thing. Do you know this? In four years, there's been no music in the White House. Right. Wow. That's right. amazing. Now think about that. Think about that. Wow. No music. No pets. No pets. No pets. Wow. Enough wow. said, right? We're here Enough to change. Enough said, Marvin. Dang. We're all we're all here to change that. Yes. And um you know, before you, before we go, I just want to um, express my my thanks to you for for doing that that thing in London we did together. Yeah, that we, was fun. We, we were together with the London Philharmonic Youth Orchestra, and we put we we essentially made sausage that week, right? We put together a, a, a an incredibly difficult piece with a with a great group of kids. And they they stood up to the challenge. They did, they did. And and thanks to you, I have to say when we first started, both of us the first after the first rehearsal that night said, "Where's the nearest bar?" <laughs> That's pretty much true, yeah. But they they really they really uh, they were great. They were they were terrific. 
So yeah, a lot, a lot to be thankful. It was it was such a great experience, and and we ended up staying at like Hogwarts, as you may remember. <laughs> um, and the thing is, I don't know if you knew this. And if you didn't, it, I, I may have to apologize for, you know, whatever, not not even talking to you at the concert afterwards. But I was sick as a dog Some, somewhere in the in the uh, breakfast that morning with those Hogwarts scrambled eggs thing. I got so sick that I ended up spending the entire day in the bathroom oh. and and could basically, you know, just barely keep it together to conduct that concert. I think I spent the whole time with my hand on my stomach because it was so bad. So, you know, if I ran out of there without even saying saying goodbye to you, I apologize, but I, that's I where I was. I don't remember any of that. I mean, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I mean, that was that was a terrific week. We and, and we also met some great musicians, didn't we? Yes, from, we did. Some of the people from the from the Philharmonic who came and coached a lot of the kids on the classical side. Oh, really and the trumpet player who we got to sit in. Um, was it John? Yes. Barkley. Yes. Very good. Wow. <laughs> I guess that... I told you how young you are compared to me. I could, I wouldn't <laughs> yeah, but that was. Just... I ain't that young either. Yeah. This is John there. Barkley was the guy that that did all the the 007 themes, right? The, the recordings. I think so. Those, yeah. Those movies. Yeah, that was great. So want to highlight in the chat that you can learn more about Marvin. Uh, we put the link up uh, at uh, marvinstam.bandcamp.com. So check that out if you want to learn more about him, get some of his music, you can find him there. The uh, Let me just make a correction there. The This is, this is the, uh, uh, if you go to that page, it has all of my recordings in it. On any of the recordings, you can get it for streaming or buying. And and I talk a, a little bit uh, about about the recordings, and it has to do, uh, you know where it was recorded and who's on it and everything. But also, if you want to get into some of the uh, bio stuff, you can go to marvinstam.com, and okay. you can you can see it there and and so on. But yeah, uh, I, I I want to I guess the thing that I want to tell you is as much for me. If there's anything you want to listen to, you've got to check out these musicians I've been playing with for years. Not just the guys in the small groups, but some of the big bands. These are incredible people. Incredible, you know, and I was really honored to be able to play with them over these years. And yeah, I got a lot to be thankful for <laughs> Thanksgiving. You know what I thought? I'd like to go out with your tune you played on Alone Together, because I thought that would be appropriate mm. to being in the, where we are these days. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, uh, but it's a it's a great tune and it's uh, it's lively. So I'm I'm gonna play that, and we'll come back. Uh, you know, normally every week we end the official um, proceedings. And we uh, we hang a little bit. We have an after gig hang. So if anybody you know out there wants to hang a little bit and chat, you're uh, more than welcome to. So I'm going to play a little bit of this um, alone together with Marvin, and then we'll come back and wrap it up. How's that sound? Sounds good.
Very nice. Marvin, thanks so much for doing this. Um, Thank you, it's really been a pleasure. I, I, I you know, I, when we open up, we got to figure out a way to get you and your, your group down here. Well, I'm, I would love that. I, and I'm sure they would love it too. You know? Yeah, I'm sure. I'm Thank sure. So we'll love the music. Exactly. We've, uh, we're lucky we built up a nice little following down here. So, we, you know, I, we used to, uh, for 15 years, we've been presenting live jazz down here in Red Bank, New Jersey, um, and this area. So, uh, you know, people seem to love it, and they keep coming back. So, I don't know, I think we're doing something right. <laughs> but it's so nice of you to... Um, to, to give back your honorarium that will definitely go to, to somebody's um, scholarship no doubt for next year so sure. I, I definitely appreciate that and, and uh, uh, like I said I'm going to uh, close the proceedings with this did I do it? oh with that thanks everybody for coming Thank gotta you. hit play Joe oh yeah sorry in two weeks we got Randy Brecker on deck. And hey, Joe, just want to say hello. There you go. <laughs> ah, thank you. <laughs>